Now I'd like to tell you a little bit about Richard Wood, and I think you'll find out more when he's speaking to you, that he brings to you a wealth of knowledge about um, rural America. He's a former reporter for the Denver Rocky Mountain News. He's an attorney, he's an author, and of course his book, Survival of Rural America, Small Victories and Bitter Harvests, was published in 2008 by the University Press of Kansas. It examines the causes and effects of the massive depopulation of rural communities throughout the world. And there's lots of theories about why we have this, but I think he will tell you more about using Kansas as a surrogate for rural areas everywhere. He tells the story of people in small, remote towns who are trying to stabilize their populations, and in most cases, they're failing to do that. The book provides a counterpoint to What's the Matter with Kansas by Thomas Frank and which he argues that the decline of rural Kansas was caused by the political choices made by Kansans. And what he's saying in many ways that he contends the rural decline is a worldwide phenomenon, largely unaffected by politics. On one hand, you say one was caused by politics. On the other, he's saying it was not caused by politics. It's a worldwide phenomenon. The book also examines the effects of rural America um, on government policies. Changes in agriculture, including productivity increases and the introduction of sustainable farming and ranching methods and the quest for alternative energy sources. We hear more and more about energy, our renewables, and the sustaining forces. And it addresses the importance of rural America to the country's culture and identity. Mr. Wood has received a BA in history from the University of Kansas and an MA from New York University in political science and his law degree was from Georgetown in Washington, D.C. We just finished our dinner and a comment was made about tell us, you know, in relation to your superior education at the University of Kansas and he smiled and he said, my education at University of Kansas was superior. So I think you'll have that opportunity to find out what he means by that. His first book was Here Lies Colorado, A History of the State, told with a series of short biographies of notable Coloradans and Colorado families, which was published in 2005. From the early 1800s to the present, Here Lies Colorado provides a who's who of the people and families that made Colorado what it is today. Um, Wood is a native of Kansas City, but now makes his home in Estes Park in Denver, Colorado. I think you will have an opportunity this evening to not only hear what he has to say, but ask questions and maybe get more answers to why you came this evening. So it is my pleasure then to turn it over to Bill Lacey, director of the Dole Institute of Politics, who will then be talking with Richard Wood. Thank you, Barbara. And I'd ask you to join me in welcoming Richard back to campus. <laughs> I'm sure campus hasn't changed at all since you were here. As I like to tell my friends, this wasn't here. This was all, I think, uh, crops. This area to the uh, uh, side of, of uh, Iowa that we're on now. And I think it's an improvement. <laughs> you begin your book, very early in your book, by debunking two political theories of rural Kansas's decline. You talk a little bit about Tom Frank's book. But then you also go back 107 years before that to William Allen White's editorial, What's the Matter with Kansas, in which he blamed the exact opposite forces. Frank blamed conservative and, and uh, capitalist policy. William Allen White blamed populist and anti-capitalist policies for the decline of rural America. You reject both of those. Why? And, and what is the, the real cause of the decline? Um, well, I think that both William Allen White and Thomas Frank approached the subject with a preconceived agenda. Uh, and I think if you look at their, at their history of, of their writings, uh, it's pretty evident that they had a pretty strong political ax to grind when they attacked the subject of what was going wrong in Kansas at the time. And so they both ended up seeing what they wanted to see. Uh, and as you say, in the case, but they ended up on the opposite side of the political spectrum. Um, when I came up on this, I really approached it, tried to approach it more like a reporter. And that's where my only real 
writing training came from, was being a reporter for a newspaper where you're at least supposed to approach things by asking questions, getting answers, and telling, the, telling what you find. And as I started to do this, a number of things became evident to me. I had read Thomas Frank's book, which was a bestseller, uh, What's the Matter with Kansas? And it, but as, as I was doing the research for the book, I, I, I realized there was something that wasn't making sense here, that he tended to lay a lot of the blame for what was going wrong with rural Kansas on a, a, a conservative uh, capitalist policies. And yet, as I looked around the, the world, really, the uh, decline of rural communities was even worse in socialist countries and in it, it, it ended up making no difference what the political system was. Rural communities all around the world were experiencing the same kind of declines or worse declines. And I think those declines are, are traceable to things that don't have much to do with politics but have a lot to do with uh, the Industrial Revolution and, and productivity on the farms and uh, a number of other factors that, that really uh, uh, don't know any political um, uh, boundaries or, or are not guided by any political agenda. Uh, and so that's why I think it, it's truly an international phenomenon. I think it's misleading for people like uh, William Allen White and, and Thomas Frank to uh, try and make this a, a, a partisan political issue. Uh, and, and I think the facts are pretty much self-evident that, 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 that that is not the case. From your work, uh, and I know you did, we talked about it this afternoon, you did a lot of travel, you talked to a lot of different people about this, but in, in your work and in your book, what did you identify as being the principal problem that rural Kansas faces? I think the principal problem is a, is, it's a close question, but I think it's principally a lifestyle problem. I think now that more and more people from rural America get to go off to college and they see the world and we all travel around so much and we have the internet and everything, people get used to and get liking the amenities of an urban lifestyle, whether it's in Lawrence, Kansas or New York City. And they don't want to settle for what they regard as a, as a less amenity-filled life, whether it's lots of restaurants to go to or things like the Dole Center to go to. Um, people get seduced by the um, amenities of urban America and suddenly small town doesn't look very attractive anymore, even if there is a job available. And that's the other thing that, that is a problem for rural America is that there may not be that many good career path, uh, long-term jobs that people want to do. But, uh, I found pretty much that that was not, that even if you offered them a good career path job, say as a doctor or a lawyer or something in a small town, uh, either they or their wives would say, you're not getting me out of Prairie Village, you know, and that's because of the lifestyle issue. One of the things that you mentioned a moment ago and you, you cover in your book is you cover modern agriculture and how it's affected this decline. Well, it's been, the numbers are phenomenal. Um, the in increase in productivity thanks to the Industrial Revolution and then the Industrial Re Revolution as it applied to agriculture. Uh, you can get kind of different numbers, different statistics on this, but basically one farmer today can do the work of five or ten farmers 50 years ago. And that just means there's not going to be as many jobs on the farm. And you know, there's been machinery has improved, fertilizers have improved, uh, transportation has improved. The whole situation has made farming much more efficient. It's brought about, and it, it was a purposeful government policy to some extent to do this. And it's brought about a very high standard of living for people in this country and, and very low prices for food, uh, considering everything that, that, uh, else that exists out there. But it has come at a price. And uh, the price has maybe been the quality of life in, in rural America. Okay. Um, one of the reasons you started your book was a piece that you read where one of the communities, I think you said it was Minneapolis, is that right? 
uh, was offering free land to people who had moved there. I mean, talk a little bit about uh, the concept of the of free land and how that's being utilized by some of these communities. That was what first got my attention to this uh, subject was I had, I live in Denver where housing prices have been on a, up until recently, have been on a tear and land prices and, and I read about these communities in the Midwestern United States that were so desperate for people that they were giving away land. And I thought, well, that's a big change from what I'm used to here in Denver where no one's giving away any land. And one of the towns was Minneapolis, Kansas. That was the town my father was born in. And so I got curious. I said, what could have happened to have turned what was, I think, a nice little county seat town into a town that was so desperate that all you had to do was come in and say, I want a couple of acres, and, and they'd give it to you. And so I started traveling and talking to people and going around these towns. And it turns out there's 10 or 15 other towns in Kansas that are doing the same thing, and towns in Nebraska, North Dakota, South Dakota, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Missouri, you go on and on and on, Iowa, doing the same thing. And um, it's all in an effort to stimulate, uh, you know, to, to, to really get people's attention. And I discovered that in many cases they were attracting people who wanted the free land and, and built the houses. But they also were getting a lot of free publicity. Like I think I read my, the story I saw was in I think the Wall Street Journal or USA Today or something. And they were getting a lot of publicity for rural America by doing this program. And um, so most of the towns, I think all of the towns that are in the book, that I focus on in the book, are towns that have turned to this free land approach. Uh, upon closer examination, it turned out to be a little less generous than it seemed to be because the price of land isn't very high in rural America anyway in a lot of these lots. But, but it gets people's attention. What are some of the success stories that you talk about in your book? And uh, let's start with, with Abilene and the Russell Stover factory. Well, that's, yeah, that, there are different ways that rural communities do well. And Abilene and the Russell Stover factory is, a, is an example, kind of a top-down thing, where the, the company decided to put a big factory in there. And, of course, Abilene has some other things going for it, too. It has the Eisenhower Museum and, a, you know, a pretty good location. Mm -hmm. um, but that's a, a kind of a, uh, somebody, I guess, at Russell Stover headquarters decided we want a factory and let's put it here. And they did a study and they, they, they decided to expand it and, and keep it going. And that provides a lot of steady employment for people in the Abilene area. Um, and, and that's one way that these things happen. Somebody, and this is the way small town economic development people, that's what they dream of at night, is that Microsoft is going to decide to put a huge facility in Larned, Kansas. And they work hard to make that happen. It's also, in the, in the economic development trade, it's called buffalo hunting, you know, or elephant hunting sometimes. You're, you're, you're going after a big company and trying to attract them to your little town. And that doesn't work, by and large. Occasionally, as in the case of Abilene, it has worked. But most often, the towns in the book, it came from the, from the ground up. It came from people in the town. Uh, we were talking earlier tonight about Nita Jones in Sedan, Kansas, people who just say, I'm not going to take it anymore, and who get together with their friends and neighbors, and they just say, we're going to draw the line here. We're going we're to go down you know, with our boots on, but we're going to make a, make a fight. And uh, I think when that happens, the small towns have a chance to survive. I, I wouldn't say to prosper necessarily, but to survive, as opposed to the kind of bad news is there are little towns where you get different political factions and different groups that are at each other's throats, and, and little towns can't afford that luxury. So I think... One of the keys that I kept coming up with was a small group of people, and it is a small group of people, five or ten people, who decide they're going to make it work, and they just make it work. And you feel that one of the keys to small town survival, rural America survival, are schools. Why is that? Explain that to everybody. Well, because 
Unfortunately, what happens in rural towns in Kansas, in Colorado, everywhere, is as towns begin to lose population, school boards begin to get nervous and start closing schools and consolidating schools and because they're trying to save money. And once a town loses its elementary school, that's pretty much the end of the line. I don't know of any cases of a town that has lost its elementary school and has managed to be successful. Um, people, you know, given a choice, we have lots of towns we can live in. Let's live in one that has a school. So why would we want to live in one that doesn't have a school? Um, and there's a, one of the, my favorite towns in the book is Tipton, Kansas, that was told they were going to lose their school. And they got together. They, they learned this in June, I think, or May or June. And they got together, a town of 250 people. They were going to lose their elementary school to Downs, I think, or some town nearby. And they built their own school over the summer, opened it up in September. And it's a tiny school, but it's kept the town kind of hanging in there. And they did it all with their own money, a lot of volunteer labor, and 95 degree August temperature, and they pulled it off. So, they, and because they recognize that if it's gone, we're gone. We've all traveled in rural areas, although most of us now think that tooling down I-40 is traveling in a rural area. It really isn't anymore, but one of the phenomena that you always see when you're, you're traveling are all these odd things, you know, dinosaurs along the roads or things like that. You, you came up with, and you actually bought it, but actually you attached a very clever name to those. Uh, you call them purple cows. Can you talk a little bit about purple cows and how they affect the survival of uh, rural America? Yeah, I, I came across that term when I met Chuck Camo, who's the head of De San Fournier, which is a high-end furniture operation in the unlikely town of Plainville, Kansas. And he was telling me about what he has observed, you know, works and doesn't work in small towns. And he said, what these towns need to have a chance is a purple cow. And I asked him to kind of explain that. And he means something so that you don't just blast right by on I-70 and, and not even blink. And there are a lot of purple cows in Kansas and other rural states, and I have, have some of them in the book. And some of them are kind of weird, like the, the, world's, oh, the world's largest ball of twine and yeah, yeah. the world's <laughs> deepest hand-dug well and the various kind of hokey things. And, and in Sedan, Kansas, the yellow brick road, which is painted on the sidewalk there, you know. They don't, it's not exactly one of the seven wonders of the world, <laughs> but it sort, of, it sort of works, and it gives them a certain amount of pride in their community. It gives them something to do. And uh, so purple cows uh, are, are indeed a, and I suppose a purple cow could be a good factory too, that's, that's, you know, or a college is a great purple cow. I mean, small towns that have colleges have a leg up on even better than being a county seat. Colleges are wonderful. Lindsburg, we were just in Lindsburg over the weekend. What a wonderful little town. Salina. Yeah. Um, Car Hinge was one of the more interesting ones, right? Some guy built that out there. That's the most amazing thing. If you've never been <laughs> to uh, western Nebraska, uh, you all know Stonehenge in England. Well, some people in Nebraska decided to do a Stonehenge, really a recreation of Stonehenge, but they do it with cars, with junked cars that are sunk into the ground <laughs> all around. It's the most bizarre sight. Um, <laughs> worth a trip, uh, almost worth a trip. How is uh, telecommunications technology making it better uh, for people out in rural America? It's terrific. Um, thanks to the internet and I suppose television, you know, the, the satellite and cable television, there's really no information deficit 
for people living in rural communities. You can, I mean, I get most of my news from Yahoo, and so do they. You know, and they get, they're, reading, they're looking at the same page I'm looking at. And if you want to, as you all know, who, work, who play around with the internet, if you want to dig deep, you can dig deep. No matter if you're in, you know, it used to be you'd have to be at the New York Public Library or something to, or the Watkins Library at the University of Kansas. Now, you don't have to be. You can do, you can do business, you can do research, cultural, everything. And I think the internet is a huge uh, uh, equalizing factor for rural America. And fortunately, rural America has some pretty good small telephone companies that have uh, responded with, with good broadband services, uh, reasonably priced. And so most of these towns, I, I never had a problem staying in touch. I'd go into any of the smallest town, go into the public library and sit down and be on the internet in a minute. And many of these towns have, uh, because they're small towns, they have a wireless, you know, town wireless internet all through the town. So in some ways, they're probably ahead of, of urban America. Are there, did you find examples of a lot of medicine being done via telecommunication? There is medicine, and it's, it's, it, that, that's increasing a lot, whether it's, whether it's doctors getting information from urban, you know, from, from like the University of Kansas Medical Center or someplace like that, or patients being monitored remotely for medical conditions. I think that also is a, is a way that communications and the internet is being used to make uh, medicine uh, and healthcare in general better, uh, higher quality in rural America. And, and I think that's, that's probably an area that's gonna grow a lot more as the, as the uh, technical capabilities and the, and the broadband speeds increase and, and uh, the uh, knowledge of the products the software products that, that support that become more well known. Uh, a doctor in, in a small community could have access to the head of the department at Johns Hopkins, you know, with some difficult issue. And uh, I, I think that's a very hopeful sign also for rural America. One of the ironies that you point out in the work, uh, Richard, is uh, on the one hand, President Eisenhower was a champion of the interstate highway system. On the other hand, the interstate highway system has really played a significant role in the decline of rural America. Speak to that a little bit. Yeah, President Eisenhower in 1955, we, we had the, the, the interstate system go through and it has, and interestingly, his hometown of Abilene is on the interstate system. So he was looking out after the folks in Abilene. But in other cases, it's, been the, 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 it's meant the decline of certain towns. And, but it, it isn't too different from what happened 100 years ago when the railroads came through. It was the same issue. It was just 100 years ago, if the railroad bypassed your town, you were in trouble. And this time, if the interstate bypassed your town, uh, life gets harder. But I found towns that are on the interstate that are not doing well. And I found towns that are off the interstate that are doing well. So that's not, it may be an excuse some of them use, but I don't think that's the main, the main factor. Uh, thanks to the, the, the system, and Kansas has a good highway system, both state and federal, uh, nobody's too far from, from good transportation uh, in, in the state of Kansas. Okay. A lot of small communities have made efforts to promote tourism. Talk a little bit about the amazing 100 miles and how it's affected rural communities. And this is also something that occurs in different states. We have in Colorado people who are trying to do this on a stretch of I-70. Out, west of, out, out east of Denver, where they, they try to get a bunch of communities to band together and create a, a, a reason for people to stop and get off I-70 and visit their towns. And there's a group in Kansas, this amazing 100 miles, that starts about in Wilson, Kansas, and then loops around through Lucas, which is the grassroots capital of Kansas, and ends up, I think, over in Hayes. And it's a scenic highway. It's, it is a very, a, a very pretty highway. And they've managed to get all the communities along the route to co-promote the amazing 100 miles. And not all of it is amazing, but it's worth a trip. I mean, I, I think it's a, it's a nice diversion from I-70. And the trick for a lot of these towns is there are something like 12,000 cars a day going by each of these places on I-70. And if you can get 
two or three hundred of them to pull off for a while. That'll be very good for your town. And that's kind of why they do these things. They want to just get people's attention and say, what, maybe we should go look at that. You know. What role does the federal government have in, in assisting rural America? Well, or should it have? Um, there are a lot of different opinions on that. There's a guy who I quote in the book who's a newspaper editor in North Dakota who thinks the federal government should spend its money elsewhere. He said, you're just pouring good money after bad. You know, you're, you're not going to be able to solve this with federal money. Um, but the farm bill, which comes along every five years, has a sizable amount of money, I think around $20 billion, which used to be a lot of money anyway, that is allocated towards rural development. And um, I think most of that is well spent. And I, I got a picture of how that's spent and how it's well spent particularly in a little town called Palco, Kansas. Um, and Palco has about 250 people, but it's a lovely little town. And they got, I think, two, two and a half million dollars in state and federal money to redo their water and sewer system. And it wasn't money down the drain because whoever was the funding decision maker for this, I don't know if it was the governor or the fed, federal agency or whoever, they only did it because Palco had already, the people in Palco had already spent a lot of their own money reinvesting in their community. And so the, the, the uh, uh, state and federal funders realized that this would be money well spent, that if, if, if they gave it to these folks, they would know what to do with it. There are other towns in Kansas and other rural communities where people don't reinvest in their community. And I think neither the federal nor the state government pouring money on top of that is going to make any difference. But if you can find local communities where you've got a strong group of, of motivated local people who are willing to put up some of their own money too, then I think that's money well spent on behalf of the state and federal government. Uh, you point out that Kansas has approached this whole issue in a more unique manner. Talk a little bit about how it's been done by the Kansas state government and how effective that's been. I think Kansas has, uh, maybe because it is so clearly a state with strong rural interests and, and, and a lot of the politicians and a lot of the policymakers come from rural areas that I think rural Kansas even these small towns, has a fair amount of clout in Topeka. And that may not be true in some other places, like Colorado, where I come from, where I think rural Colorado frequently gets, you know, shunted aside by the Aspens and the Denvers and the mountain communities and, and all those things. I think rural Colorado probably doesn't get its fair share of attention at the state level. But Kansas, because of its strong and, and, and kind of appealing rural background, um, has had more success. Kansas rural people have had more success, I think, getting attention at the state capitol. And as a result, I, I get the sense it's been a higher priority. I know uh, Governor Sebelius on several occasions went out of her way to uh, make efforts towards recognizing the achievements of rural Kansas and working for uh, attracting business to rural Kansas. The Kansas uh, uh, development people, uh, when a small town wants to try and attract a business or grow a business, they're all over the place helping them. Um, there seems to be a lot of cooperation in Kansas, uh, as I say, more so than I think I've seen in, in some other areas. And, and, and I think that, again, it's like in small towns, when you get cooperation, when you get people working together, you tend to get good results. What role do universities like KU have in promoting rural Kansas or helping to better understand rural problems? And, and what are universities are helping or hurting? Um, well, there are universities, of course, like the state, like Iowa State, Kansas State, that have an absolute agenda. I mean, they are or are supposed to be focused on helping rural America, r r rural Kansas, rural Iowa, wherever it is as opposed to the University of Kansas or the University of Iowa that have a little more nebulous role to play. Um, 
but people who are out there in the field every day and who, people who, who kind of know what's going on also sometimes complain that places like Iowa State and Kansas State really spend more time catering to the big corporate farm and corporate ranching interests than they do to the small uh, family farmer or the, or the small uh, family rancher. I don't know, if I wouldn't be in a position to know if that's true or not. Um, but I think we talked a little bit at dinner about the, the, the University of Kansas working on a program to promote rural entrepreneurship through its business school. I think that's a wonderful uh, role for a university like this that has a good business school to focus some of those assets on those communities where they can have so much effect. You know, you, you, you put a little pilot program into Kansas City, you won't even make a ripple. You put it into a little town of 1,000 or 2,000 people, you can make a huge difference. And so I think a relatively small amount of resources from a, a fine state university like this that has programs in business and, and commerce and marketing and things like that can have a lot of effect in a more bang for the buck in, in rural uh, Kansas than they can in the uh, places like Kansas City and Wichita. Um, and I was really glad to hear that program is underway. I think that's a, that's a terrific uh, uh, news for people in rural Kansas, as well as the program that the school has had for many years, where they take uh, every year people from the college, from the university community go out and visit all around the state. The Wheat State Tour, I think it's called. Uh, I don't think that was here when I was here, but now they, they, they get people out and say, let's go meet our constituents. And they take them out to places like Palco and Plainville and Lucas and all these places. And they begin to learn a little bit about the state that they're supposedly you know, representing. And I think, it, I think that results in a lot of good uh, feedback. And maybe that's one of the reasons why some of these good programs are coming out of the school now, because they're not ignoring that part of the state anymore. Okay. I have one more question, but then we're going to open it up to Q&A, so be thinking about your questions because uh, you're going to about to get your opportunity. Richard, my last question tonight really is, you know, you've done this uh, fascinating book. What's your assessment of, uh, of where rural, rural Kansas and America goes from here? What are the prospects for, for rural parts of the country? Well, I think the numbers are still not good. I, I think it's still going to be a matter of managing decline rather than managing growth for, mo for most of rural America. There will be exceptions. There will be a Russell Stover plant in a few places or something like that. But I think in many of these cases, the question is, how do we manage decline? How do we, how do we adjust services to serve people in areas that are continuing to decline? Maybe we can slow the decline. Um, and this is not unique, by the way. You might have read there, there, are, there are declining industrial cities in the Midwest that are having the same problem, Youngstown, Flint. Rural America is not the only place on earth that's trying to figure out how to manage decline. And I'm, but I'm afraid that's the nature of the, of the, uh, of the project for rural America is trying to reach a level that you can kind of stick at. I mean, obviously, if it keeps going down, it's going to disappear. So tr trying to find a level where it stops going down. And we don't know where that level is. Nobody really does. Um, but I hope there are enough people who value the amenities of rural life that there will be a number that will stick and make it work. And uh, I, I think that'll happen, but I think you're also going to see sad stories, you're going to see ghost towns, and you're going to see situations that indicate that the overall you know, picture, and this is throughout the world, as I said, China has a much worse problem than we do. China has tens of millions of people leaving rural China every year and begging on the streets of Beijing. So. This is a problem that, that doesn't just affect Kansas, it affects the world, but it's a problem of managing decline, not managing growth. Okay. Let's sort of open it up to questions now. As we always do, ask you to raise your hand. Andrew is the young gentleman with a microphone. Andrew, just pick somebody and let's go back and forth from side to side. And I would point out to everyone 
that not only can Andrew carry a microphone, he was also my research assistant for tonight's program. So please do ask one question. Have you spent any time talking with Marcy Penner? Pardon me? Have you spent any time talking with Marcy Penner? Email. I've, I've not spoken with her. Okay. Yeah. She's, she's, I don't know if you all know her, she's uh, involved in, in, a, in a group that is trying very hard and pretty successfully to discover all the good things throughout Kansas. And um, she's, she has a newsletter that comes out what, four times a year or something like that, as well as on the internet. And she's, uh, she's one of those Kansas promoters who, who are so important to the state. Is there any way that the uh, influx of immigrants from south of here the question is, is there a way that the influx of immigrants into this country can be used, can, can be a plus for rural America? And the answer is yes, in some ways it is. Um, in fact, one of the very few groups that is moving as a group into rural America is the Latino, Hispanic, population. Um, they tend, however, to be moving mostly into places like Garden City, Kansas, Marshalltown, Iowa, meatpacking communities. They don't tend to go to the real small towns, um, but they obviously are a valuable part of that, of that uh, meatpacking industry, which is a valuable part of, of this state. Um, but you go to, and, and you go to southwest Kansas, and, and that'll be where most of the growth out there is coming from. Um, and there also, there, there's a fairly good migration of Hispanic, Latino population into places like Olathe, but I don't consider Olathe really rural America anymore. So. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, a city like Kansas City has historically been pretty identified with uh, rural Kansas and rural Missouri all things rural. What stake does a city like Kansas City have in the continued vitality of, of rural areas? Well, I think that's probably, you can make that also, I'd say Kansas City or for that matter, you know, Chicago. I mean, I think what stake do we all have in making sure that rural America is healthy? And rural America, what, what, hap what would happen if rural America just blew away? You know, I, I don't think I think it would be disastrous, not only from the point of view of food supplies and everything else, but also from a cultural perspective. I think a lot of the culture and the heritage, the arts, music, everything that we value in this country, if you look at it, a lot of it comes from rural America. And I would hate to see that you know, no longer be the case in the future. We, even though not many of us live there, and not many of us pay that much attention to rural America, we still kind of have a soft spot in our heart for rural America, whether it's country music or artists that we like. Um, I think in some ways, you know, even though we, we, we don't actively live there, a lot of us, or our parents, as in my case, come from there. So we want to see it succeed. Um, and, and I think there is, I don't know, I'm not, it would probably take... It would take somebody a lot smarter than I am, but there probably is a, a connection there that if it's broken, it could, could hurt the country in some way. If we totally lose that connection to rural America and if we totally lose the benefits we as a culture get from having a vibrant rural America. I mean, after all, we've changed over the last 200 years from a country that was 99% rural to a country that's 90% urban. And that can't help but take a toll, and can't help but change um, the the culture and the, and the uh, the story of what this country is and where it's going. Andrew, who's our next question? Uh, how much do you think the Green Revolution can uh, help salvage some of the? Uh, the problem that we're seeing out in, what, in rural America, whether that's, say, wind farming or an emphasis on organic and local farming. 
uh, some of those issues. Is, is that something that can really save rural America, or uh, is it just sort of a trend? I don't know that it can save it, but it's a positive trend for rural America. And a lot of people in rural America, in Kansas, in Colorado, who I ran, ran across in connection with research for the book, are capitalizing, uh, particularly in the area of food, uh, raising organic, natural products, which they find people in cities will pay a lot of money for, to their surprise, I guess. Um, that's a lot of, uh, of people are capitalizing on that and doing well with it. And that's a, that's a positive farmers markets and all that kind of thing. I think that that's a, that, that is a plus for, for uh, rural America. One of the people who I profile in the book is Bill Curtis, who's a graduate of the University of Kansas, a former CBS newsman. And he's running a natural beef business down in Sedan, Kansas. And I hope it's running successfully. Um, and, and he's a good example of someone who's trying to capitalize on that uh, interest on the part of people in rural and uh, urban America for better food, for better quality food. And of course, that's going to be produced by, by uh, people like him. And it tends to, the good news is that kind of farming and that kind of ranching tends to require a little more labor than the old feedlot out in Dodge City. You know, the, the feedlot is a pretty efficient way to get beef. It's not the most aesthetically pleasing way to get beef. It's also an efficient way to get diseases. <laughs> Kansas has 105 counties, and uh, most of the 105 county seats are in dire trouble declining. I just wonder what uh, you think of the idea of consolidating the number of counties to save some uh, expense in government service. Well, I, I mention that in the book because that's one of the solutions that people look at a state like Kansas and say, why do they need 105 counties? And you're right, a lot of those county seats don't have much going for them. And I think some consolidation would be a good thing. I don't think consolidation is a panacea, though. I think in the school systems, we've discovered that you can consolidate, but big isn't always better. And... Um, but, but I do think in terms of, of essential services, uh, medical services, public safety services, cultural services, things like that, more consolidation, more county-to-county -county cooperation and things like that ought to occur. And I think it is occurring. Um, and I think Governor Sebelius, when she was governor, wanted to make that one of the things she looked at. I don't know if she ever got around to it, but she, she gave a couple of talks where she kind of hinted that that was something she was going to look at. And I think... That's something that the legislature and the people in these counties should, should begin to address. Of course, you get to a political question because every little county government doesn't look like much to you or me, but to them, that's their job or that's their neighbor's job or, you know, so you, who's going to give up what? You know, who's going to be the, 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 the top uh, provider of services in that area? If you say to two or three counties to consolidate, that may mean fewer jobs. And that becomes an issue. Has Walmart been a positive or a negative benefit to or impact uh, to rural Kansas? I think that there are books that have been written about that, and mine is not one of them. And they're fascinating. I, I enjoyed reading, and I wanted to do a lot more on Walmart, but I, I realized it was a whole other subject. Um, and I think it depends a little bit on who you talk to. If you talk to some of the business people, they'll say it's been a negative, the, small, the retail business people. If you talk to a lot of the consumers, they're quite happy with it. Um, and I, I, I tend to think that if it wasn't Walmart, it would be somebody else. I think... The decline of these small town retail businesses is unfortunately kind of inevitable as populations shrink and as the ability to travel quickly on good highways increases and uh, people are going to go to Salina or Hayes or somewhere to do their shopping instead of nearby. And, and if Walmart had not seen that opportunity and capitalized on it, I suspect somebody else would have done so. Um, 
But it's interesting to see how small towns are trying to cope with that problem. Sudan has somewhat the same problem, and they, they feel they've had, a, they've had some success in trying to create businesses, retail businesses that, aren't, that, that are kind of unique and that aren't something you can just find at Walmart. Um, so uh, small towns recognize this problem, but it's a, it's a two-edged sword. I think a lot of them wouldn't want to see Walmart go away either. Um, or, or it could be Home Depot, it could be whoever it is. Um, but Walmart certainly takes the heat politically. So they're, they're the lightning rod for, for all this, and, and you see protests against them. Um, but I think on balance, if you took a vote, um, they'd probably still be there. Thank you, sir. Richard, you have intrigued me with the uh, purple cow idea. And my mind has been just going like this with it since. Uh, I think of examples, West Jackson and the Land Institute is better known throughout the world than it is here by far. And uh, Dorothy and the Wizard of Oz in many ways is too. I, and I don't know, I suppose it was because of the pollution of the land that they didn't go ahead with that Oz idea. But do we have something in Topeka or somewhere, do we have a consortium of people who sit around and think up these things? Because I can think of a million things that would help bring more people. Uh, for example, when I went to teach in London, I, I couldn't wait to get and see Jeremy Bentham because, you know, the founder of utilitarianism, he's in a glass case. <laughs> And he's wheeled out to board meetings. They're, They're getting London. dangerously close to being called down for filibustering, Richard, so ask oh, okay. your question. <laughs> well, is there something like that? Is there some sort of anything in government, an agency here, that can start to really think tank that stuff? I'll join it, even. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if there is, and one of the things I was hoping Governor Sebelius would, would aim for, and as I say, she seemed to be open to this idea, and I've talked about this with the governor of Colorado too, is too often we, at the state government level and at the federal government level, we lump rural issues into agricultural issues. And I think that's, that's wrong for a number of reasons. Uh, one of them is only about seven or eight percent of the people who live in rural America today actually work on a farm and anymore. It used to be different, but it's not that way now. So I was hoping she and the governor of Colorado and these people would, would consider creating, maybe just on an advisory basis or something, a department of you know, rural life, rural quality of life or something. I don't know. And, and they may yet, but that's what's needed, I think. We tend to say, well, we've, we've passed this big farm bill and the Department of Agriculture is out there. Things must be okay. But that doesn't really touch these kinds of questions. That, that's not creative thinking for rural America. That's uh, not doing the job. Uh, and I hope, and we have some people in the legislature who are here tonight, maybe they'll take that back and work on it. I was raised in St. Louis. Um, I, did, I was able to have the privilege to raise my family in a farm in western Kansas, and it was a privilege. But I realize that that is declining. And so I was real eager to see what your book said and what you said this evening. Um, because I think it's sad that it has declined. I think it's sad that the value system is disappearing and the work ethic and so forth. So I was really excited. But I don't know that I feel better since I've read the book. But I was... Um, <laughs> Sorry. What's um, your question, ma'am? I was, and I think purple cows come and go. Um, I've seen that happen. Uh, but um, I was curious about your mention of sustained, the sustaining farming, and I think that's fine. If you have a lot of money, you can do that. But I don't know that that serves the average farmer. Um, I think a lot of farmers are in trouble. A lot have been able to increase. It seems to me that farming is for big farmers now. Um, I get upset with the corporate farms that are being created. Um, but I think it is too bad, and I think anybody who grew up on a farm longs for that 
period when they grew up on a farm, even though times were tough, life was simple. We don't have that anymore. Ma'am, I'm but, sorry. Please ask your question. But all right. So my question is: Would you explain a little bit more about the the farming that you ended your book with, the sustaining, the sustainable farming, and all that? Yeah. Well, that's. I think farmers and ranchers, and it certainly cuts across both, are discovering that uh, uh, organic farming, sustainable uh, practices and all that can actually pay off. And there's been a lot of good studies out of uh, K-State and Iowa State, the uh, Leopold Center at um, Iowa State, on, on how that can work and actually make more money for them than raising commodity crops for Archer's Daniels Midland, you know. I mean, I, I think it, it takes a little more work, it takes a little more effort, but there are a lot of success stories of that, and, and uh, even the USDA uh, ha has been helpful in some respects in, in promoting practices, um, plowing practices, um, seeding fertilizer practices, things like that, teaching farmers how to farm without massive amounts of, of uh, the kinds of toxic fertilizers or, or um, pesticides that they've been using, um, but it does require a little mindset change. I think it can work whether it's going to be big enough to make a, a huge difference. Again, everything we talk about in terms of something good for rural America, you're, you're still fighting against the tide of, by and large, of people leaving. So it's going to take something, it's going to take a lot of initiatives like sustainable farming to make a difference. We have time for about two or three more, Andrew. I think we've got three hands up right here, so. Yeah, a couple of uh, real quickie related questions. Well, one the question, 80s, please, sir. One and a half. What <laughs> 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 the f family farm crisis of the 80s, uh, is there still a family farm possibility in rural America? Family uh, farm? Family farms? Yes. Yes, and there are not as many as I would like to see, but there are people uh, doing that successfully in Kansas, in Iowa, in Nebraska. Unfortunately, there's a lot of factors working against that uh, as families, as the farmer gets older and the estate has to be settled and, you know, the, these things tend to end up in, in bigger and bigger and bigger farms. Uh, but there are a lot of young people particularly who are, you know, trying to make it, who are trying to go back to the days when a farm actually had a little livestock and some, and some truck crops and some, and some wheat or some corn or, you know, that, that, that day is not, is not gone and there are people who like that lifestyle. Um, I don't know if it's enough to make any uh, measurable difference to rural America, but it is occurring and it's being promoted by uh, some of these people and the more forward thinking people at places like K-State and, and Iowa State. So, and, and there are even classes. Uh, Iowa State, I know, offers uh, extension classes and outreach classes to teach uh, young people right out of high school, right out of college, how to create a family farm and how to market the product and how to get it to Whole Foods or wherever you want to get it. So people are working on this. Uh, you gave a couple of examples of small communities, rural areas that are doing well. Could you address a question about the leadership within those communities? I mean, does a community just have to have some people that have a lot of get up and go? Does that account for their success? Other communities that don't have it. It, it, it really boils down to that. It, it boils down to a handful of people. It's like most things in life, if you think about it, whether it's your business or the Rotary Club, or whatever it is, there's always a few people who do all the work. And in these small towns, it's a handful of people who, I, I mentioned uh, this woman in Sedan, Kansas, just a, a, not more than five or ten people in Sedan, Kansas, who got tired of seeing every store in Sedan, Kansas shutting down, and they, they decide to do something. They're not quite sure what. They're not skilled in this area. They're not trained in economic development, but they just want to do it and uh, they can make a big difference and and that is the that is the key and communities that are lucky enough to have those people seem to have a pretty good chance of surviving um, 
of course, the negative thing from the point of view of a small rural town is it is just a handful of people. And if one of these people dies or moves away, there may not be anybody to take their place. So the leadership in these towns can be very fragile. Or the other thing is they can get at loggerheads with another little group in town over, do we really want to do this or do we want to do that? And they end up fighting with each other. And as I said earlier, I've seen this happen in towns, and that's a luxury they can't afford. We have time for one last question, Andrew. Uh, Richard, uh, the Dole Institute hosted T. Boone Pickens last spring. I wondered what you feel that if that were to be successful, his wind program could mean to rural Kansas. The wind? Well, we, we drove here on I-70 and saw that tremendous wind farm starting about Russell, I guess, and seems like, and running almost to Salina. Um, I don't think it's going to have a huge impact on rural lifestyle. It will create some jobs, and it will create some income for the, for the rancher who can still have his cattle and 10,000 turbines, too. So it's good for rural America, but again, it's not probably a silver bullet. It's, it, it's, a, it's, it's a move in the right direction, I guess, and I'm glad to see it, and I'm glad to see, after all these years, the wind in Kansas is being put to good use. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, thank you very much for coming to the Dole Institute. We really appreciate it.